All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Workforce Wednesday Careers In. And this time in March of 2020, I'm proud and pleased to present Careers In Fashion. Woo! So today we have a fantastic, fantastic lineup of panelists for us. Um, first, a couple of housekeeping uh, issues. Number one, bathrooms are outside. For my studio audience, please make sure your cell phones are off. Please remember that we are taping, so I ask you just be mindful that sound is really, really critical during this process. Um, you have some note cards. Those note cards are for asking questions. I'm going to ask questions of our panelists for a little bit, and then we're going to take a break, and then when we come back, we're going to ask you all questions, okay? So panelists, we're going to begin with the most infamous question in job search history. Tell us about yourself. And I would love it to also end with your astrological sign. Okay. Anyone is feel free to take it. There is no order or reason. Right. I'll go first. Um, go. My name is uh, Stephen Ryan. Um, I currently work as the top of bed designer for boys uh, in team at Pottery Barn as a contractor. Um, and my sign is Libra. All right, I'll go. So I'm Fran Farmer, and should I give a little more? I'll give a little more yeah, about yeah. me. So I grew up in San Francisco, and I'm first generation. My parents are both from Britain, and my dad was very, artistic, so he used to paint and kind of cartoon and love music and dancing. And my mom taught me how to sew. And so she taught me about textiles and introduced me to fashion in that way. And I have three brothers, so I actually love professional sports because when I was growing up, that was the only way my brothers would talk to me if I, I talked about sports. Um, and early on, I knew I wanted to get into fashion. I went to the Fashion Institute, Design and Merchandising, in San Francisco and, at, in, in, and in LA. And um, worked in apparel for many, many years. And then I went back to school and learned computer graphics. And then I got into the home decor side. And I also work at Pottery Barn Kids, along with other home decor companies. So I have the apparel side and also uh, the print side. That um, currently I also have a startup jacket line, so everything is made locally. Um, and my sign is Virgo. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, friend. You're welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Amy Gutierrez. I'm a Bay Area native, and I've been working in the design industry since 2007. Um, I've worked for a variety of global brands. Uh, I focused in accessory design and product development. Um, I'm currently working at William Sonoma Inc. for the label Pottery Barn Teen. Steven, my friend here, is a colleague of mine. Um, and I'm a Capricorn. Thank you, ma'am. My name is Marie Joa or MJ. I've been a textile surface designer for 36 years. I grew up in the Haight-Ashbury. I started designing when I was 19 for Esprit de Corps, which at that time was like the H&M of the world. Um, I, I dropped out of art school because I got a full-time job with Esprit. I started working in the factories overseas then. I uh, worked for a lot of companies in San Francisco, and as the apparel industry in San Francisco dried up, all of us who worked in fashion switched to home furnishings, probably in the 90s. So that's why you're going to have a lot of people who do both. Uh, I just got back from India a couple days ago. I was working with an Indian manufacturer on his home furnishings line, but I am currently doing my own line of yoga wear and all of the designs are visual magical potions for healing and the fulfillment of destinies. And this is one of my astrologies. I'm wearing my sign. I'm an Aquarius. All right. Thank you so much, panelists. I really appreciate that. Um, some of you kind of touched on this. 
uh, in your little intros, but actually, no, you did it. Excuse me, that's the next question following up after this. But um, tell the studio audience, what did you want to be when you were younger? You know, a lot of times we get asked this question, what are you going to be when you grow up? What are you going to be when you grow up? And a lot of times we say things that have nothing to do with where we end up. So I would just love to know, what did y'all say to that question, what did you want to be when you grow up? Uh, I think when I was a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. Um, when I was very little, I thought that, was, that would be a fantastic job. Um, whether it was be for the military or commercial airlines. I was, my father's a builder, uh, he's actually a roofer by trade. Um, so I got into that industry fairly young, from about the age of 12. Um, and my father was, you're not going to do this, I'm worn out and I'm like 40 um, and I don't want to get into this industry so you've got to study and you've got to go to school and the only thing I was really interested in at school was drawing um, and you know just arts and crafts really. Um, I did okay in languages and other things but I couldn't see myself studying that so um, I left school at 15 um, and I went to <coughs> a local arts college um, to study on a course for two years that was kind of it was called a BTEC, which is kind of introductory to design course, um, and it, it kind of covered um, graphics and textiles. And I, you know, coming from sort of I guess a working class background, um, I was really into sort of getting my hands dirty. So I um, really loved like the silk screen printing side of textile design, but I also loved using like early Photoshop and early, you know, just early Macs. So the combination of, you know, using a Mac to get the imagery to put on a silk screen to print with was really interesting to me. So I kind of fell in love with it really at like 16 years old. Um, had no idea where it would take me at the time, but just really loved what I was doing. Um, and drawing and, you know, all these things kind of fit into that, um, that process. So I just kept going with it. and really did what I loved and then just, yeah, it kind of grew from there. So I was told that, um, you know, do you want to go to university to study this? And I was like, if it means I can continue doing this, then yeah, I'd love to. So <laughs> I had um, a couple of interviews with some local universities and was given some unconditional offers, which means that um, you don't have to have any qualifications to get in, it's just purely based on your portfolio. And it really just came from belief in myself and really um, actually just loving what I was doing, I think that's really the key to it. So I, yeah, and then I've, I've got into a university course locally, I couldn't afford to live there, so I lived at home the whole time um, and had part-time jobs to pay for it. Um, so I was doing five days a week at university and then one late night in retail and then the whole weekend in retail and then uh, that paid sort of a bit of my way towards uh, my education which was a lot cheaper back then. Um, and then I you know, specialised in print on my second year of my degree, um, having done work weave and knit, um, which I didn't enjoy so much. Uh, it was too, you couldn't undo what you were doing. It was all very, you know, you had to have it very precise and I liked to try many different things. So print was the way that I wanted to go. Um, so I specialised in that. And then um, I was told, uh, there's this school, like, do you want to try and do a master's degree in this? Um, and I wanted a job, but you know, I was kind of a bit done with education. And so um, they said, no, you're not ready for a job yet. You need like another couple of years. So I think you should do a master's. So I got into a um, pretty, I'd never heard of it. Um, I got into a pretty good school in London and uh, called the Royal College of Art. And uh, got in there and did my two years there and then came out and had my company for a couple of years. So that's kind of how it developed. And then was just sort of offered jobs um, based on my network that I was trying to build up at the time from university and from um, essentially cold calling people and showing the portfolio um, and selling work and getting projects whenever I could, just in Europe and London and greater UK. Um, and then got offered a job um, at a Japanese firm in London called Michiko Kishino. That was great, and then worked there for a couple of years, and then moved to Italy. Um, worked, um, yeah, I did some licensing work there, but the main part of the job was working for Jean-Paul Gaultier um, on mids and swimwear. And then 
I was offered a job in Sweden for a gentleman called Jan yeah, Lindenberg, and I left Sweden. I came back to the UK and worked a little bit, and then I moved to Amsterdam to work for Nike, and then um, left Nike and then worked for a denim brand called G Star Raw, and then was there for six years, and then yeah, then I met my wife who's working at Levi's at the time, and uh, we moved to the US about six years ago. And I've been here ever since, just contracting for everyone, essentially. Just yeah, so that's my story. That's how I kind of got into it. But it was purely by accident, and just again, I can't you know stress that enough. Like you've really got to love it, and if you love it, you'll really the pitfalls won't matter. Like you know, whatever happens, because you love what you're doing. The negative side of it just I don't know. It doesn't really enter your life. You know, it's just just gets washed away, brushed off, if you love what you do, you know, off someone else. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I was young, the first thing I remember I wanted to be was a mermaid. <laughs> and, uh, a mermaid. <laughs> and it was really the shell bra. That was really what it was. <laughs> I wanted that shell bra in a big way. And then when I got a little older, now, you have to picture this. San Francisco in the 60s is a go-go dancer. And again, fringe. I have a love affair with fringe. It was the fringe dress, so I wanted to be a go-go dancer. And um, then eventually, I actually wanted to be a flight attendant because I wanted to travel. You know? and, um, and then it was actually on a trip that that kind of led to, OK, what, do you, what are you really going to do career-wise, which started the questions that ultimately led me to go to design school. But those were, shell bras and a fringe are still pretty big with me. That's a great segue. I wanted to be a marine biologist when I was a child. <laughs> Maybe I would have met you under the sea. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, and then that kind of transitioned as I was navigating my way through high school. I wanted to maybe go into healthcare and study medicine, but I kept really being drawn into this, into the art and design world. Um, I and I just really like Stephen said, you kind of just follow your passion, and it kept directing me down this path. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't have a lot of guidance from my family, um, but I got into a four-year university, and they had a design program at UC Davis. And um, I just kept eating up all of the, the things that I was learning about color theory, um, the different design disciplines. There were, you know, I, I dabbled in a little bit of everything, graphic design, fashion design, textile design, furniture design. Um, I just, I loved working within constraints. And I think that's kind of the difference between design and art when you're at the academic level. It's um, your project briefs are, are a little bit different. Um, and um, yeah, getting out of, getting, graduating with a four-year degree, um, I didn't, don't really feel like I was set up for success in industry. There weren't outreach programs like this, so thank you, Aria and CCSF, for offering this to the students because I can't stress enough what's helped me is my network. Um, so buddy up with your classmates because you never know where they might land later on after you graduate. Um, it's, it's really great to just get a personal recommendation at, uh, rather than getting uh, lost in a sea of online applications once you're trying mm -hmm. to find that perfect job. Um, but um, yeah, I'm going to pass it over to you, FJ. Mm -hmm. I started drawing when I was probably two, as soon as I could pick up a pencil. And I was always drawing without worrying really just costumes and women. You know, I would take any towel, any piece of fabric, and like swab myself, always, always. So I always knew I was going to be a designer. There was no question. My father told me I would never make it in design, and that I should be an accountant or an actress. And of course, you know, I ignored that as well. Um, I had people who helped me, 
who saw that I was talented, friends of my parents, I was introduced to a woman who was a textile designer because I could paint with gouache, which is the traditional <coughs> medium you use for textile design. Back in the old days when we actually painted and throat. Um, I became her apprentice while I was in art school. And that's how I got the job to Spree because she was the head designer for Spree Decor. So I fell into it. It was a detour. I always thought I would work in theater. I did work at ACT for a while. There is no money in costuming. It's really hard to survive in costume. I've done costuming on the side and for independent films and stuff, but really I was making money and supporting myself and my filmmaker husband by working for corporations. And because I had started doing textile design, I kept doing textile design and surface design. I mean, I've designed dinnerware, I've designed rugs, anything that had a surface, wall art, anything that required any art. If you, you know, I read this quote by a design designer, I forget his name, but he's like, if you can design anything, you can design everything. So you may have detours. You may start out in fashion and wind up like me designing bed sets. But that it's still, you're still creating, you're still designing. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I love that. Thank you so much, panelists. Um, panelists, I'd love to hear about your very first non-fashion job and a skill or an experience you gleaned from that that you apply in your fashion work today. So first non-fashion job and where you learned a skill or an experience that you then apply to in your current work. Anyone can begin. Um, yeah, okay. uh, my father, as I said, was a roofer, so from an early age I was on um, you know, learning that trade. So the biggest thing, well, the, the majority of the work that I was did was, was called um, felt and batting, which means you have the rafters of a roof where they join at the, the top. And what you do is you lay felt down and then you put wood, a uh, certain like, wood panels basically, across to like help the felt stay where it is and then you put the tiles on the roof tiles on top of that. Um, teaches you to have a lot of trust and um, how important it is to have camaraderie with your workmates. Um, and it also teaches you a lot of discipline. You have to be awake to do that kind of job because you're working at height. Um, so yeah, it teaches you basically how to get up in the morning and how, how important it is to just turn up really and, and be awake and be aware and um, and to listen I think that was the main thing that I got from that, that kind of work and also how to um, deal with deal with maybe the wrong phrase um, how to be accommodating to as many different type of people as you possibly can from any different any different walk of life you know, I think, uh, if you have that skill set, you, you'll do all right. You know, if you can actually talk to anyone and uh, not be afraid to talk to anyone and approach anyone, and keep an open, open mind when you are talking to those to anyone, um, I think uh, I think you, you do well. And that's definitely a life lesson I learned from from my early years in before I got into design for sure. Cool. Um, my first non-fashion job, I was a bookkeeper, worked in the accounting department for an insurance company, and um, I already knew that I was good with numbers, but having that job really showed me how good I was with numbers, and fashion is, there's so much about numbers and measuring and accuracy, whether it's pattern making, whether it's calculating out, like costing, you really have to be good, and if you're not good, you're gonna have to hire somebody who's good with numbers, just because at any time you're making something, it's every inch is dollars. So you have to be really good and accurate, and I will, even though that particular job, every job has communication, but I will definitely second. I think communication is key 
just for everything, and it's uh, speaking, it's listening, written communication, you know, is, is really key for, for all positions. Okay, I'll flip the rotation. Um, well, I started as design work at 18, so prior to that, I did babysitting, which that skill didn't come into play until I became an executive and had to deal with other executives. <laughs> um, and I will tell you, the further you go up the ladder of corporate, the lower you have to sink your IQ, and the more accommodating and tolerant you have to be, because people in power act like small children. I um, would tell the designers I managed that working and designing in corporate was uh, the biggest test of selflessness. You could not be attached to any outcome, positive or negative. And I said, you know, working in corporate will teach you selflessness better than being stuck in a Tibetan monastery. Um, I've worked retail, and uh, it was a brief, brief stint in retail because it just, it's a little soul-sucking. Uh, I learned in that job that I'm very much a behind-the-scenes kind of person. Um, but it's also really interesting to just watch the flow of a customer going through a store or um, how you can quickly arrange a surface and make a sale because you put something, an object out in someone's awareness. So um, that was, that's something that I am constantly thinking about while I'm designing is just thinking through the lens of the customer. Um, I can definitely relate with what MJ is saying about executives and um, a lot of my day-to-day -day is balancing the need of the customer and the expectation of the executive. Um, very rarely do we get to interact with our customers, but um, with brands whom I have worked for where they encourage us to visit the retail space, uh, it is really engaging to uh, get more data and information about uh, the, the needs of the customer and how to create solutions for them. Um, yeah, I would say like problem solving and navigating expectations is uh, a big part of the, of the job and I'm glad that I had that early retail experience. Um, and yeah, moving on to the next question. Excellent, thank you panelists. So sometimes I like to do a too long, didn't listen recap of what the panelists say. So basically what I hear are some of the most important non-technical skills necessary to be successful that they gleaned from their experiences. Trust, discipline, knowing how to show up for your team, being awake, aware, and learning how to meet people where they're at, and not being afraid to meet people where they're at. Math, 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 math. Every inch is money. That's, that's amazing, I love that. That was really, really astute and illuminating, thank you. Every inch is money. Um, the higher up the ladder, the more you're gonna have to practice non-attachment because people uh, apparently act small at times, so it's really important to stay cool, calm, and collected. Um, and then also being able to make sure to observe how customers uh, receive information via the senses. Thinking through the lens of the customers, trying to strive to get more data about the customer experience and how to connect with them, and also more importantly, how to manage expectations up front with everyone they you work with. Is that about right? Did I miss anything? Okay, thank you panelists. Next question. Um, tell us about your very first fashion gig. Who was it for? What was it like? What were you doing? Were you stoked? Were you scared? Did you have imposter syndrome? Were you like, no, I got this? Right? Like, just regale us a little bit about the very first time you finally were like, I got the job! Um, I had to 
couple of early like, printmaking experiences when I was in college. I worked for a, a plate making factory um, that was doing um, yeah, just printing magazines and stuff. Um, the first real, I guess, fashion job I had was, again, a work experience position. Um, what was it? I don't know, it was Docklands, I think, somewhere in, in London. And uh, just was making like catalogues for this company using cold draw and it was like there was an artist creating flat sketches and I was reinterpreting them as you know um, yeah vector art and then they were being put into catalogues to show off um, yeah the collection and that was my job and I would help out with um, you know anything I could so trying to you know get to know people there um, and help them wherever I could. So, you know, offering opinions and, you know, whether they shot me down or not, I just, you know, I just would offer my opinion on something. Fairly naive, but I guess it, it's, a, it's a nice way to, to be, looking back. Um, yeah, that was my first experience. It was a, it was a good one. They were a really um, great group of people. I think it inspired me to want to continue um, to, do, to, to do what I was doing. And I think that's really important. Um, when you have a little bit more experience working for whoever it might be, whether it's factories, corporations, other artists, um, small, medium or large, the people that you um, work with are really, really important. They're the ones that make or break how you feel about, a lot of times, uh, make, make or break how you feel about yourself in that role. Um, the team that you're with is, is they've, they've got to be nice people. There's a lot of politics, or you know, um, for want of a better phrase, a lot of bullshit around it. Then you know that affects you every day, and you know when you're somewhat attached to what you do, that makes it quite difficult. You know, so cherish a good team. You meet a good group of people, really um, appreciate them um, and uh, respect them, because it's uh, it can be quite a rare thing to find that sometimes. It has been my experience. Anyway. If I may ask a follow-up question to that before we continue, how would the studio audience be able to identify or seek out a good team to cherish? Because I know, I think that's true across all industries, and I would just love to know if you have any seeds that you can plant for them. Like, how do I find a good team? How do I find the right people that might fit with me? I think your network, as we've all mentioned, is really important with regards to that. Um, I think you're more likely to find a good team if you have a contact there. I think if you know that person, that contact, then you have a rough idea about who they are and who they work for and th therefore the people around them. Um, in, you know, you never know really. I mean, it's like you can ask loads of questions about when you rent an apartment, for example, but until you live there, you're never really truly going to know what it's like, you know. Uh, whether or not the guy downstairs from you is going to cook really smelly fish late into the night, or the person upstairs is going to have a, is going to have a dog that barks constantly, or whatever, you know, it all seems great, but then you know, when you really get into the nitty gritty of it, you're never really going to know. But network is important, and uh, having that, and having people uh, around you that are you consider to be um, good people uh, that you get on with, then uh, that's that's I think. A, a bit of a sign of, as to where they work, how they're getting on, what they're up to, how their life is in design, um, and try to establish how they truly feel about where they are and what they do. That's a, that's a good way of judging. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I feel like uh, when working with teams, it's um, all about like celebrating the successes that you have together, and then you know you guys can all be a shoulder to cry on um, when there are upsets, because there are, and, and you know what, you make it through and you carry on, um, but, uh, you know, like, you, you celebrate birthdays with your, your teammates, you know, talk a little politics here and there, um, uh, but I think showing gratitude to the, your coworkers too. I think design can sometimes be a somewhat intimidating industry. There are some egos that you have to navigate. Um, but I, I find that you know the more that you can find common ground with your, your teammates um, can make for 
for just a pleasant work environment. Uh, because work is work. I mean, of course we all want it to be unicorns and rainbows, but people are gonna have a bad day sometimes. And uh, sometimes it's those personal connections with the team that can, can get you through. Okay, I'll tell you about my first, yeah. my first fashion gig. So um, I actually got this when I was in design school, and so it came through the job center. And it sort of it came through as uh, this organization needs someone to design cheerleading uniforms. And I already touched on you know my love of sports, so this was right up my alley. And um, so I met with the people, and I don't know who else they met with, but anyway, they chose me. And um, it ended up, I thought it was a high school, but it ended up actually being the San Francisco 49ers. And it was after they had just won Super Bowl yeah, 16. So all of a sudden, the, the 49ers had gone from like a nothing to superstars. And they didn't have any of that. So once they won the Super Bowl, you know, the PR team was like, oh my God, we've got to get like a mascot. We've got to get cheerleaders. We've got to get all this stuff. So, um, and it was top secret. I mean, I couldn't tell anybody that I was working for them because they didn't want this getting leaked out and getting spread around. But seriously, I went, I was, the interview was at my school. <laughs> so it was so like, yeah, it just seemed casual, like high school. And then they're like, okay, no, this is actually with the 49ers. And so this is top secret. And I'm like, okay, oh, terrific. I'm really excited about this. And I walked to the car and I was like, and as soon as I got in the car, I was like, yes, I got this thing. I was so excited. And um, they didn't know, the organization, they had never done this before. And the only reference was the Dallas Cowboy Cheerleaders, because like I go back. So, and they were like carte blanche, you get to do whatever you want. So I was like, okay, we are not going Dallas Cowboy Cheerleaders. We're gonna yeah. keep this more wholesome. And I got to go pick the fabrics and we, and I made the first patterns, and I know, and then I got connected with a production pattern maker, and just the whole process, and like I did, of course, like a zillion sketches for them. And they actually took them down to the board of the 49ers where Bill Walsh was on the board, like all these like, like names, you know? And of course, I was just being the sports enthusiast, I was like, this is fantastic. So then I go to LA to finish my second year um, down at Fitham, and it was the coolest thing to see my designs on TV. Oh you know, <laughs> the dance squad, and then they like send me a picture from my portfolio. <laughs> so, well, you know, brothers are brothers. <laughs> so, you know, like and they were just very like, no big deal, you know, friends. I don't know what she really does. She does some fashion stuff with clothes and but you know now it's like all these years later I find out from their best friend like in the neighborhood how how cool they all thought it was mm -hmm. and oh my god and now she's leaving for LA and oh my god this, and she's working with the 49ers and there's her stuff on TV and, you know and Terry Hatcher that actress she was one of, she was one of the you know on the dance squad and then I get a phone call like and, Terry Hatcher's on TV and they just showed her being for Shirley Beautiful, so it was pretty wild, you know? It was cool, yeah. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Amy, MJ? Um, well, I guess my, technically my first job would be as an apprentice to a textile designer. So, you know, and I was very fortunate to work with this wonderful woman, Betsy Lamont, who trained me in everything I know today. I don't think I was in awe, but it was a great learning experience. And the way she taught me, the way she trained me, those, those values and, and that very caring, nurturing way I was taught, I tried to emulate when I trained designers later on. And so it, it, made, a, it made a lifelong impression on me. And it turned into a legacy because those designers will then again train people in the same way. What Steven said about people, the people you work with, I mean, let's face it, you're in an office with, for 12 hours a day with people, and they become like family, especially when you work with them for years. You are closer to them. You know every secret. You know every snack 
they live for, you know every detail about them. So you have to really like them because that's your world. It's, it's so, you're so connected. You're more connected to the people you work with than your family. Because you, just by the sheer number of hours you work with these people. And so you have to have people you can trust. And we don't always, we're not always able to pick our jobs. Because if you get a job, you get a job. You know, and I, and I think in design, we have to be very cognizant of the fact it's not easy to find design jobs. So you kind of have to make do in the situation you have. And I believe those situations form you. And I believe we're all on a spiritual path, whatever your spirituality is. Each moment is a spiritual test. Usually being with people you can't stand also is a spiritual test. And how you can maneuver them and come to a place where you see the similarities. Even if you don't like somebody, you see and understand where they're coming from. I've learned a lot of compassion over the years. And you know, even when I didn't agree with people, I still could love them as their being. And, and then I was able to work with them because I could see where they were coming from. Even if I didn't, even if I wasn't coming from the same place. And I think that's a, a huge skill, is to see yourself in another one. Yeah. Amy? Can you remind me of that initial question? Yeah, the initial question um, was your very first fashion gig. What was oh, it like? Oh, yes. Um, so my first fashion gig, um, I really, there was a company I really, 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 really wanted to work for, and I was like, I have to get that thing. And so I took um, a job that I didn't even know was existing, but um, I worked in a color lab uh, for the North Face, and the job was to review little swatches of fabric and make sure they matched the specified color that the designers wanted. And then I would communicate what needed to change about the color to the supply chain vendor base so that they could correct it, make sure all the colors would match. So, for example, um, young woman in the audience who has a jacket. She has, there's buttons on her jacket, there's thread that is comprised in that jacket, there's lining in the pockets, and all of those components need to match, but they're being manufactured by vendors in different places, maybe even different countries. And so it was my job as the color analyst to uh, make sure all of the color was aligning. And we use uh, an industry standard you may be familiar with is Pantone. So Pantone creates uh, a giant rainbow of uh, colors, and we would you, you assign a very specific like spectrum color. It has a special code, and so the vendor in Asia and the vendor in India and the vendor you know over here like they're all they, they all order their color assignments from the same place so that everyone across the globe is looking at the same color. So it was a very strange job that I had no idea uh, was part of the industry, but it got me my foot in the door and it is, uh, evaluating color is definitely a skill set I still use to this day. Um, it's really important in terms of uh, kind of differentiating a high quality good versus a low quality good. You might not see color matching as accurately. Uh, but it took a lot of, of, of manpower just to make that happen. And uh, it's not, it wasn't super glamorous, but that there are a lot of people in the workforce doing that behind the scenes work. Um, so it was really great to get that experience just starting out. Wonderful, thank you panelists. So the too long didn't listen. People, people, people.
Can't stress that enough. The, the way, the people you work with are gonna make or break how you feel about being on that team. You're gonna be too connected to your work family just based on the sheer number of hours you work with them. How can you practice seeing yourself and others even when you don't agree with them? Where is the oneness? Pay attention to the little things about the people you work with as this will create peace and equanimity and that's what Common Ground is based upon. And this is, these are the experiences that make a team a team. And just to kind of follow up, behind the scenes work matters. So there is no job too big or too small in order to be successful in the fashion industry. Thank you, panelists. This is fantastic. All right, panelists, what is, okay, let me phrase it this way. You're in a time machine. You've gone back in time. You've gone back to your previous self. You're about to walk in the door. Let's begin your fashion journey. What piece of advice would you give to your younger self before they began this journey? So what piece of advice would you give to your younger self before embarking on the fashion journey? I think uh, be uh, as open-minded as you possibly can. Um, and be prepared to try new things, um, wherever they may be. Um, yeah, I think open-mindedness is just, um, also yeah, another one just Try and, try and be as adaptable as you can. Don't have any, um, try not to have too many initial opinions about something before you try it. Because you don't know what it's going to be like until you do it. I think that's what I would tell myself. I think for me it was just about being as open minded as I could be and not be too much of a small, small, small town boy. You know? <laughs> I think.
uh, some advice that I would give uh, my younger self is you will design things that you do not like, and that is okay, <laughs> and you will move on. <laughs> Um, you, uh, it take, it, design is, uh, there's, a, there's a team, there are leaders who um, are looking at things from a more creative direction standpoint and just because you're the designer assigned to the product line or fashion line, that doesn't mean you have the jurisdiction to call the shots, sometimes you have to compromise. Uh, so being open to compromise, being open to uh, looking at things through a different set of eyes, um, and your your name isn't necessarily tethered to the work that you're producing. Sometimes you have to uh, appease the audience. So that was that's I think. When I was able to like let go and accept that I was going to be making things that I might not want to carry or wear or like uh, bring into my home, but I just have to. It's part of the process. It's part of the job. Um, and you you find a uh, silver lining in it at some point. I think having a not no attitude, which is you. You know, as designers, we're control freaks. We just don't. Uh, you just apply it that way. You're controlling your design, your creation. Really, when you're designing for other people, whatever you think you know doesn't really necessarily apply. So each situation you go into and each project you design, you have to start from completely fresh. Doesn't matter how many years of experience you have, each new design you design project or design that you're going to work on, there's a whole new set of rules. It's a new day. And I think when I was younger, I was thought, oh, things should turn out a certain way because the little A, B, C, D, E. No. They go H, Y, Z, L, and then maybe you get back to A. And you just have to allow that and not, again, it's not attachment. I would say non-attachment is the greatest thing to be going to be doing this in Excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, too long didn't listen. Get mentors, y'all. If you want to have a company, get a diverse set of mentors. Right? So mentors on the business side, mentors on the marketing side, mentors on the design side. If doing what you love gets stale, time to look around for what the new thing is. Um, and as always, networking is the key to success. So it's not about who you know as much as, and most importantly, who knows you. Um, your name greater than sign the work you do. Sometimes your work is created for the masses. And then I kind of liked, uh, I kept hearing the term be, the word be. So the phrases I heard the most were be prepared and open-minded, be fearless, be okay with designing things you don't like. Be open to compromise. Be fresh. So, not no attitude. Each new design project is a new day, not attachment. And believe in yourself. That's wonderful. Okay, panelists, time for the wild card round. Um, please pick a number 1 through 36. Steven, we're going to be with you since you've been wonderful. What's that? 31. Number 31. He knew. All right, that's great. Um, describe the color yellow to someone who's blind.
that I gave to someone was a terrarium that I had made. Yeah. Oh, wow. Was it custom made? No, I, you know, I had, um, it was winter and I was just in one of the, I have to make stuff. <laughs> I have a, you know, that creative thing took over and it was too, and I'm a gardener too, so it was too cold and wet and everything to be gardening and I really wanted to garden. And I had a couple of vessels, like glass vessels in my house and so that was it. I just started buying plants and making these terrariums and, you know, you can only have so many terrariums. <laughs> I have a lot right now, but, but I was like, okay, this is like perfect for a Christmas gift too. So and uh, and we did this white elephant thing at Christmas, and so the person who actually picked it was like actually the perfect. As, you know, I could have scripted it better, you know, for the person who actually picked it. Picked it. So it wasn't consciously custom, but maybe yeah. it was unconsciously custom. That's wonderful. Thank you, friend. Yeah. Amy. Twenty-two. Of course. Uh, what's the most interesting thing about you that we wouldn't learn from your resume? That's when you get when you pick number 22. <laughs> <laughs> MJ does. <laughs> Ooh, that's great. Well, right, I'm just going to have at it. Um, I am Look at the safe container we built, everybody. Thank you. Cool. Thank you for sharing that, Amy. That's very important. Fantastic, Amy. Wow. Okay, MJ. 18. Number 18. Here we go. What inspires you? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm only pausing because I get inspiration yeah. every single second from everything I see. I'm constantly processing everything. I get it. Today on the bus, this beautiful little girl with her hair all like funky cut, wearing this purple outfit. So excited she was counting the, the stops to her final destination. That inspired me. So being, I mean it sounds cliche and hokey, but being alive and when you find creativity in every second, the thing is you then then you're always breathing design. You're always breathing. You're always creating. Because when you see that every element in life is part of the process and part of the story, and it's not, oh my, my, I, my job as a designer. No, I'm a creative being. I think everybody in the world is a creative being. They just don't realize it. How you comb your hair in the morning. Or if you don't come here. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. The choice you make is actually that's design. And that's creation. All right. Thank you, MJ. That was wonderful. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's all the questions from me, your TV show host. We're going to take about a 10, 15 minute break, and then we're going to come back for questions from the studio audience. Let's give our panelists a round of applause.
And now, let's look at these challenges now. Um, I think, and I've learned this over the years, is riding the wave of how the economy affects the market, you know, um, fashion and home not as much, but especially apparel, really gets impacted with what's happening in the economy. So, um, and you know, when I started, everything was still domestic. And then, so I went through those waves of where a lot of companies move things offshore, and then the job market would shrink down, and then, you know, it would kind of boost back up, and then maybe there was another economic thing, and it would kind of cr crunch down. So, riding that wave of um, what type of jobs are available, um, and that's where actually expanding your skill set is really important, and to be able to do a variety of different jobs. So, not necessarily only design jobs, but like you talked about color jobs, you know, like I can do apparel and I can do print. I'm really strong with technical, also construction, QA, and that kind of thing. So, the more diversified your skill set can be, um, that I think is really beneficial for longevity in the industry. Um, I think for me, um, the hardest part was um, actually finding work in the first place. I think that um, I had to, um, in the end I, I, I bought a really cheap PC, this was back in the year 2000, 20 years ago, um, and I worked out my parents' like, entrance hall area um, with a small printer and a really old slow PC with a pirate, dare I say, a copy of Photoshop. And I would just make prints um, and then find out contact details where I could for design departments at department stores. Um, anywhere that I could try and sell my wares, so to speak, I'd just try and cold call people and get an appointment to just go and see them and either sell work or get project work that way and try and establish a name for myself. The school that I went to um, kind of made us believe that we were God's gift to design, which is just not the right way to go um, when you're trying to um, inform designers about what the real world is like. Um, I think, uh, yeah, that was, that was the hardest part. The thing I find challenging now is um, actually finding work again. It's, it's just as difficult, especially having moved to the US and moving up to the Bay Area. There's only a few companies that you can really work for here. I'm at a stage in my life where I'm married, I have a small child, a boy, and um, so we kind of try and you know, make moves here and settle down a bit. So it's quite challenging to um, meet all those needs really, particularly with like, the way that healthcare functions here. And, you know, one of us needs to be corporate to get that, um, which is really sad, I think, because it really ties people down. and um, doesn't free you up to be as entrepreneurial as you might want to be. Um, but yeah, finding work's tough, and you know, it's just uh, again relied on the network. But you know, you just have to just keep trying and keep, you know, uh, grafting as we say, and just keep trying to get work where you can and keep going. Um, but it's still a challenge. I don't find um, actually, you know, the nature of necessarily the design work um, that tricky anymore. It's more about as I've gotten older, it's more about um, how I can make it fit my life. You know, my lifestyle and the, the, the place in my life that I'm at, I think really is the more challenging part. Um, getting everything to work out, you know, time wise for having family and, and uh, you know, the more, dare I say, uh, grown up stuff. That's what I think of it as being grown up stuff. Um, yeah, that's, that's the hardest thing for me, you know, getting able to line up with everything. I'd say when I was first starting out, Imposter syndrome is definitely a thing, and um, not feeling like I had the skill set that to match the job description. A lot of um, job training just happened on the job, and I'm very grateful that I had that experience to, you know, figure out the ins and outs of Adobe Illustrator, Photoshop, or troubleshoot through things that I didn't quite know yet manager that was um, open to letting me um, 
have to go that, that learning period, that learning curve. And now I would say one of the more challenging things that I spend my time navigating is um, actually like executive leadership. I'm not a manager or leader in my organization, but understanding the intricacies of how your organization works helps you sort of plan and plot your next move. Um, whether it be like a promotion or maybe there's a job that is in a different department that you might have your eyes set on. So um, navigating the intricacies of a organization that you might not have all the answers to. That's, I think that's the toughest part for me currently. And I'm about 15 years into my career. The hardest thing for me was in the early days when I was first free, it was the early 80s. It was wild. And I was given carte blanche, actually all of us designers, we could do whatever the hell we wanted, which was so rare. Later on, when I designed for other companies, that is not the case at all. I had to really give up my own vision and understand what that company's vision was and what its customer's vision was. So that was a challenge because you use your design skills, but you always have to see through another person's eyes, and you're not designing for yourself. And in many times, you are not being as fully imaginative or as fully as creative as you know you're capable. You're really like kind of squashing it down and you know figuring out like, okay, last year this customer bought beige, and guess what? This year they're buying beige, and you're like, really? Can they shake it up? Can they buy like cocoa? Like, can we do anything different? No, we're selling beige. We're sticking with beige. You got to make beige look fresh again. Okay, so that, that's a different puzzle, but. You have to deal with the fact that you're always kind of having to dumb yourself down, dumb your creativity. At this stage, since I've left corporate, I'm now working with manufacturers, and I'm trying to make the manufacturers overseas understand that we have to design sustainably. And that's not just a trendy catchphrase, because the planet is being destroyed. The fashion industry is the second to the oil industry in destroying the planet. It's huge responsibility for all of us who deal in anything in textile. I have photos from all the factories I've worked in all over Asia. The destruction is horrific. What's happening with these factory owners is they're thinking of profit. The American retailers are squeezing them to the ground they want things as cheap as possible. They are not paying for design. They don't care about design. And for the most part, even though they'll have their quote unquote eco initiative, they are not caring about it. And my challenge is now to figure out ways so that manufacturers can actually reuse their waste and not put so much toxins out. And I'm going up against their profit margin. But look at our planet. We have to. And I think the biggest challenge for designers today, and I think if any of you wanted to, do, to enter design, you are healers. That is part of design. The original shamans designed all the textile prints. All prints in textiles are magical and what's for healing. And this planet needs us to design a healing planet more now than ever before. That's our big challenge for all of us. Just to continue on with what MJ was saying, I know um, kind of at the early part of my career, I had a lot of guilt around our industry, and I almost chose to leave it um, because you are. You're creating new products or new garments season after season. Uh, you recognize that you know, things that you're creating are maybe just loose inventory, not even going to a consumer, maybe they're just going straight to landfill, and it can be really disheartening. Um, but um, I have taken that sadness and, and, and let it kind of fuel some of the similar initiatives to what MJ's working on with um, 
her business is you know coming up with new solutions, new ways to revitalize this industry. And I think you know people coming up through CCSF or any of the other fashion institutions, they're in a really unique place um, to like leverage new materials that are coming out. I think um, any brand would be welcoming to see projects in someone's portfolio that reuse materials in a different way to show that the designer can think strategically in how they utilize raw materials in their work. Um, so I think that's an invitation to all of you and all of us up here that we're kind of fighting this fight together um, because we do need to preserve our planet and as designers we try to sprinkle magic and beauty everywhere we can. Um, and there's uh, some strategy that needs to be done in addition to uh, these things. Yeah, I'll add in to on that sustainable note because it is a really hot topic and it's really broad. And so um, consumers, they weigh in with their dollars how they're going to shop. Designers and companies weigh in and what they're going to incorporate into, into their supply chain. And having um, just been in the industry for so long, you have to educate yourself. So don't just believe the spin that someone tells you. Because everybody has a, a sustainable initiative now or a green initiative. And, you, and so educating yourself on what is really happening with the textiles, you know, how is that bamboo process? Because there's two different ways that you can process and one is really toxic and one is not. So, you know, you have to kind of continue to ask the questions like and educate yourself about uh, the bigger picture. And because that sustainability thing is such a huge umbrella, um, I know for my brand, the way that I'm able to take this on is because I buy what's called dead stock. I call it designer closeout because I actually don't like that term dead stock, but it's fabric that's keeping it out of the landfills. But I'm still a small company, so there's only so much. It's pretty expensive, you know, if you're a small company, MJ can attest to this, when you're small, like what you can incorporate. But every company can incorporate a little bit of sustainability. It can be your packaging or, you know, a particular, or your supply chain, like I'm making everything locally. Um, so it doesn't have to be every single thing, but the bigger companies also to really uh, find out how, how true is their sustainability that they're putting out there, you know, or is it just another sales pitch? Because you, you think you're doing a great thing and maybe you have, then after the fact, you find out that they really weren't as green as they were claiming to be. So they call it greenwashing. Yeah. Or they say they're sustainable, right. but you really have to, you know, because everybody's now using that as like a catchphrase or yeah. they think it's a trend. I'm like, no, it's not a trend. I mean, take a look at our planet. We really, sustainable means we have to reuse what we have. Yeah. And, and there's, sorry, and there's cool stuff coming yeah. out with like waterless printing. And I mean, there's a lot of really great innovative things happening. Um, those things, though, they're early, and any kind of early invention is more expensive. So you end up seeing it at the higher end, and so it isn't going to be like more at a like a mass consumer level. But those, all those innovations, eventually trickle down, and they do make their way down to um, a more affordable price point for masses. You know, so just knowing what's happening out there in the industry. Um, and as a designer, when you're working with fabric companies also, because every fabric guy, like he's not making any money or she is not making any money unless you're buying from them. So of course you're gonna have a sustainable, there's the sustainable line. So just educating yourself more so you can ask important questions. I think also to that point, if you're working with a brand that maybe isn't following a sustainable initiative very well, is never forget that you, at every level, whether it's design, green initiatives, or whatever it is, you, will have, you can have an effect on um, how people's minds are changed in very abstract ways. You know, what, just turning up, being there, wearing something, they're looking at you, whatever you say, you know, it's like it can affect, you have an effect on people. And never forget that, no matter what job you're in, you affect everything around you. Um, and there's power in that. 
so it can, you can change things. So don't ever give up on that and change it. Um, I like what I'm saying here, it needs to change. It's, it's really bad. <laughs> it, it needs to change for sure. And it needs to happen yesterday. It's not good. Thank you for that real talk. <laughs> that was, that's really important. Thank you. Well, it kind of usually does start from the designers. It usually yeah. doesn't start at the corporate level. That's what happens is the designers are the ones who then focus on, no, I want to push this sustainability and however, you know, you can get, the, let's say you're working for a bigger company, however you can get them to start implementing it. And it might even just be recycling, getting recycling bins, you know, I mean, that's what started. Yeah. William Sonoma was, and it started in the design department. And it started with the guys who were um, unpacking all the shipments, because they're like, we have all this cardboard and all this styrofoam, and this stuff shouldn't all be going into one dumpster and getting them to the landfill. And, you know, so it is like a grassroots thing, you know. And you are the agents of change. Yeah. By becoming a designer, you have signed up to be the agents of change for the planet. I don't think a lot of designers realize that, but that is your responsibility. It is the responsibility of the creative to make the revolution irresistible. Mm -hmm. And fashion. And fashion. <laughs> I think those usually go hand in hand, right? Yeah. It's, wow. a new, it's a new challenge, right? Yeah. It's a new way of creating an aesthetic with a limited resource. It's like, you know, and then ways of, that's a really beautiful, you know, um, a confined space that you can work from. And it creates its own design challenges that, you know, are interesting. You know, it's not like you have everything at your disposal. You can really, you know, you have to really create something incredibly smart. And, um, you know, that is appealing at the right price. And that's what we do. So, you know, um, whether it's for active or, high fashion or whatever it is, it's like that's really your challenge as a designer. So, you know, the extra part of that is make it, you know, make it friendly to our planet and, that's, and make it friendly to the greater world, you know. It's, uh, it's just another design challenge the way I see it. And you can be those agents of change. Every meeting you're in, every discussion you have that is um, regarding a product or the launch of a product, um, you know, no matter how small, just to reiterate, like you do have that power in that meeting when you're talking to a marketing person, when you're talking to um, a product developer um, who's dealing with the factory or whatever it is. Like, if you have this top of mind, it will get through. It will get through. Um, if you keep trying, it will get through. So, yeah, just don't give up with it. Keep, uh, just keep at it, and uh, you know, your voice will be heard. Persistence. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, thank you panelists. That was, yeah, that was great. Um, could one of y'all or all of you, whichever, however you'd like, share an example of a great uh, merchandising or strategy you've seen in marketing? Like in kind of marketing some of your products? One of the question here is like, what should be the great merchandising strategy or what should be a great merchandising strategy? And I wonder if like an example of one could really like illuminate that for, for the studio audience. I um, was doing some work for a, a rug company called J4 Rugs. And it was started by a merchant family in J4, the, the father of the two daughters of the family. And he hired all of the untouchables mm. in India to weave these rugs. And they tell that story. And every time they show their work, they have the family, the families, meaning the men and women. And women traditionally did not weave rugs in India. That was because rug weaving came from the Middle East and Iran. It is a man's craft. Now they are teaching women, which means women now have the money to send their children to school because they're able to work so there. So they tell the story of how they taught a class of people who are not allowed to work in normal conditions a skill, gave them their freedom, and they have beautiful videos of how 
they are working with these people, how they have schools for the children of the workers. It has done so much to promote their product. And they're known for the beautiful rugs and cushions and all that, but also the story they tell is more powerful and everybody wants to buy one of their rugs because they feel like they're actually doing something good. Yeah, um, another, uh, on the, the apparel side, well-known company, Eileen Fisher, you know, I mean, she's really pioneered getting, implementing a closed loop system, and that's definitely not something that every company can implement, but again, like that whole sustainability thing of what, you know, even if you pick one thing and you start implementing, but I think that that creating, this closed loop, Patagonia does it too, where they start taking garments back and can get them repaired and then they resell them. And um, it's a whole other, it gives more dimension to their company, what their values are. Um, and so I think like that's really helped Eileen Fisher because from a style standpoint, like her, you know, her look kind of had peaked and it was actually kind of declining in popularity. And then this, you know, uh, really investing more internally with buying clothes back and um, doing all the, the repurposing of that, that's really revitalized them a lot. So I think from a whole, I th and I think it's true too. I don't think it's just a, a marketing given. No. It's a, it's a true thing. So I think that that is the situation where that's really revitalized your company. I think um, one of the best marketing um, stories, um, um, I know it comes from a lack of marketing. So there's a company in Holland called Flisco, um, and they create the Dutch wax fabrics for um, ceremonial dress in most parts of the Congo. And these fabrics are really expensive to the Congolese, um, so much so that they're considered to be family heirlooms and they're kept in safe, so even like swatches of it are handed down to, over generations as like the family cloth. And the way that it works is Visco doesn't make up any marketing with these, these fabrics, they just get them shipped over and they basically the ladies in the market sell them there. And as these fabrics are made into like ceremonial garb, um, they have stories associated with them, with the prints themselves. And there's one, one that I really love. Um, so there's this one fabric that they've been doing for years, um, Dutch wax cloth, and it's the, the, the motif is like spark plugs from a car, and it's like this really kind of like interesting um, layout um, of a medallion style layout of these spark plugs. And the way that they sold this fabric is that any woman that wears this um, fabric or this cloth in their ceremonial garb is known to be able to handle many men. That's the story behind this, this cloth. So every single cloth has these stories associated with it. It's wonderful. It's like homegrown marketing at, these mar at the market level to sell this cloth to people and families. And as I said, it's like, you know, it's so expensive. It's not, it's worn at weddings and, you know, celebrations, you know. It's very, very special stuff. Um, so I used to think, I, I thought that was wonderful. Like these designers are making these like very beautiful, um, you know, motifs and textile designs that are being shipped over, and they're, and they're not, you know, they don't market it at all. They just sell it in these markets, and it's just wonderful the stories that, that people associate with these motifs and how they they talked about the villages and, and, and how different families value these these cloths and uh, as I said they're kept for like generations. There's like ring I've seen them like key rings like full of swatches of the fabric that grandmother wore and the stories that they have around that person that owned it. It's just uh, it's really wonderful and really powerful as well. These uh, these cloths can have an heirloom type value. So yeah, marketing but not marketing is quite interesting. So if I'm hearing correctly how can you figure out ways to make your craft dedicated to service and serving others and then 
what is the authentic, sincere story behind what happens as a result of that intention of creating something in service of others and telling that story. It can also affect design. Like the company I work for um, in Harlem, G Star War, they have a very kind of, um, their inspiration is what would be military guard, and they have a huge um, archive of everything from, um, it's kind of shocking, like SS uniforms all the way to the first moon landing uh, spacesuits. And they invest heavily in these garments because you can take details from them to create like new collections. Um, and you know some of the graphics I've made there like were influenced by say um, how a, a, a you know a soldier would wear a uh, an Arctic or, or snow uniform. So the story is that they normally have their camouflage. Wear, um, and they would cover it with a white um, kind of uh, smock that would help their silhouette against the snow background. You know, because if you wear like a standard, you know, khaki camo, you're going to stand out against white. It doesn't hide you or break up your outline at all. So when they wear this smock, it would hide them in the snow. But their weaponry would—it's um, pretty dark. So sorry about this, but it's like the weaponry would stand out. So each soldier is given um, a roll of white tape. And what that white tape does is they put it over their weapon in small like, lengths, and it helps to break up the outline of the weapon against the snow. So you can take that story, and you can adapt that to a graphic. So what I did in that case was take the logo of the collection, and then I would put you know, white tape over the logo to break up its outline and you've got a graphic that is brand correct, that's interesting to look at and has a great story behind it if you're interested in that type of, you know, that type of story. So there's ways of manipulating stories and ideas that are the influence of that initial, you know, that initial concept piece that can influence how you approach your work. So it's not always about the feeling that you're creating from the design work and how you feel about it. It's actually what we call justifiable design. So you can relate that piece back to that initial inspiration through that story. And what the story does is also when you're trying to sell it and market, market the piece, you, create, you can create an emotional connection to that product by telling that story, whether or not it's you know, the eco initiatives that a lot of companies are having now, or through something that isn't related directly to an eco product. It's just a really great story that you can use to actually, you know, have someone create an emotional connection. And when someone has an emotional connection to a product, they're much more likely to be involved with it um, than they are something that just appears on an Instagram feed or, you know, something on their social media or something they've seen out in the world. If they have that story and it educates them at the same time, they definitely have a stronger connection to it than something that's just a random pop-up somewhere that they've seen in their life. So, for me, I like, try and bear that in mind. I've had a lot of success with print and graphics that really have a tie back and a justification to a, to a story that you can put out there that people can tell when it's left your, um, left you, you know, when you put it out in the world. If someone else can tell that story, you'll sell that product and, and, and people will like it because they have an emotional connection to it, even though it's not the greatest aesthetic they've ever seen, the story is, is really key. And I think that's more true now than it ever has been uh, in my career to date. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Love it. Um, thank you, panelists. OK. Uh, so the next question now is, how do you keep beige fresh year after year after year after year after year? after year. Um, the actual question is, how do you stay creative, relevant, and fresh with your designs? But I was thinking of what you were saying earlier about having to recreate beige every year. Amy, I'm going to hear from you in a minute. I'm going to keep my designs fresh. Um, well, I think about, um, I, even at a young age, I was really drawn to puzzles. And I think that design is a bit of a puzzle. Uh, there, when you're creating something, you know, you have your inputs, like your materials, your color, your, your print, you might have 
mood imagery and inspiration. You also have to like hit that bottom line of like meeting your cost target in order to get it um, out into the marketplace. So uh, I try to you know, kind of as a designer, you have to reinvent yourself from time to time to get re-inspired with the work. So sometimes I try and focus on different avenues of the puzzle. So like. Um, for instance, right now, something I'm working on personally is storytelling in my design work. So rather than me spending 10 minutes explaining my idea to you, I've been like challenging myself to get things really concise to where I can show you a piece of paper and you get the whole idea. You get, you get the story, you understand the features, you can see what it looks like, and it's all very concise. So for me, like I, you know, in addition to my workload, I just like to create little you know, personal challenges for myself so that I can flex different muscles just to keep it engaging and entertaining. You know, every day is a new day. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll go. <laughs> um, so you usually don't get flat, like in terms of design, but uh, if that happens or um, I'll either go into a different creative medium, like if I'm kind of stuck, say, from an apparel standpoint, I might want to paint. I mentioned gardening. I might go out and garden in the garden or nature. Um, I also get really inspired by other artists, you know, so we might hook up and talk about, like, see what other designers are doing, finding out what um, what exhibits they're going to, to look at. And, um, I think everybody has their thing that kind of feeds them, whether it is, say, going out in nature or cooking or something else that kind of feeds them creatively. It could be reading, right? I, there's a zillion things that it could be. Um, but I think um, to just break up Whatever, wherever you're stuck and to to just, if you can't find it for yourself, like right then, then I would say connect to some other artist or somebody else who is going to help kind of revitalize. Mm -hmm. Not bad. Uh, finding whatever the new page is, you know, I'll probably just go back to my previous answer, just about finding the new story. There's always a story um, around something that you can take from um, and that can inspire you. Stories are just everything. They're what keep societies going, myths. It's just everything that keeps us, gives us tradition. Um, stories are just what keeps us human. And I think they're the, they're the ultimate inspiration. So if you've got a good story and you can find a good inspirational story to design from, You'll never really have to worry about finding the new base because it'll always be there. Um, yeah. I think design is storytelling and it's mm -hmm. communication. Um, and it's a visual communication. And when I, you know, to go back what I was, to explain what I meant by the shamans being the first designers, when you go back to the cave paintings thousands of years ago in different countries, those images were not only images of the hunt that was reflected the daily life of those people in the caves, and their caves in India, and their caves in France, and Spain, and all over the world. They were also, they found out, because there were geometric symbols amongst the bison. Those were prayers, and they were literally visual invocations to the Great Spirit, which at that time would have been the Earth Mother. That was the predominant deity of the entire world 20,000 years ago. So, and I only discovered this in discovering, reading the history of textiles. All embroideries, all the diamond shape goes all over the world as a protection against the evil eye. It's in Africa, it's in micro. Asia, it's in the Ukraine, it's everywhere in the Egyptians. When you start to realize that actual design, whether it's a full garment, because garments also would tell the story 
of the people they, they, who were underneath those garments. Design is storytelling and communication. It is a visual communication. So everything you're saying, I have always believed it's a story. And there are different stories to beige, and there are different shades of beige. And so that's how you spin it. I mean, I was asked year after year to design a pumpkin pillow. <laughs> because Pottery Barn sold those goddamn things, made millions every year on a flipping pumpkin pillow. You know what a nightmare that is? Santa was another nightmare for me. And it was always like, oh my god, last year we sold X a million, and how are you going to compete it and do it the next year? And, you know, I'd sit with my design team and be like, oh god, I'm like anything but this. You know, and it was like, how do we sling this story in a different way? And it really is communication and storytelling. And your story is not that different from everybody else's because we are all connected. We are all have the same, same DNA. And I would slip magical symbols in mainstream pottery barn prints and nobody would be knowing it. But guess what? Those prints would be selling. Because they would resonate with people. Because in your DNA is all those thousands of years of storytelling and visual storytelling. Because we all come from cultures where design is visual storytelling. Any rug woven in any tribal part of the world, those geometric shapes are actually symbols that tell the story of usually that woman, because women usually make the tribal rugs for life, and usually those are the, not just for her life, but the wishes and aspirations for her daughter, because usually rugs were given to the next generation, the, the weddings. And so if you, if you realize that this is a language, they, Goes, goes through generations. And we carry that legacy and that language. So how do you use your language to tell your story? I'm just gonna let that sit for a moment. <laughs> that was wonderful. Okay, final question, panelists. What do you value most from pursuing a career in fashion, and how do you observe that it's impacted your individual outcome in society? So, kind of a twofer. What do you value most from your uh, pursuing a career in fashion, and how has, have you observed it impact your individual outcome in society? Um, and it's been nice to think back on 
the times that I've had, the things that I've done. Because sometimes you get so lost in the moment and the busyness of everything, of day-to-day -day life, and you don't take these times to look back um, and see where we've been and what we've done. Or not necessarily what we've achieved, but the experiences that we've had. And I think that's what makes life really rich, um, is not money, it's not any of that stuff, not even necessarily success. It's the times you've had and the people that you've met during that time that makes your experience and your life worthwhile. And that, to me, is the measure of success. Um, so cherish those moments and be really grateful for them when you have them. Because, um, you know, we can all talk that it's hard, it's this, it's that, and we can all get very jaded and cynical, but really it's, um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty amazing thing to be able to you know, do something that you love and that you um, want to get up every day to go and do. There's, there's something about that that is just wonderful. You know? You're not doing the 9 to 5 grind. You're passionate about it. You love what you do. You think about it all the time. It informs everything you see, everything you do. And honestly, being able to get, get out of bed every day and look forward to going to work and being around the people that you're around all day, that's awesome to be able to go and do that, you know, and cherish that and be thankful for that. Because there's a lot of people out there that don't have that opportunity and don't have that. Um, they can't say that. They have to work jobs that they don't like, be around people that they really would rather not be around all day. And so yeah, enjoy it. It's, uh, it's uh, if you can get into it, it's a uh, it's a great experience and a really fulfilling one that will make you feel that you've uh, lived. Good life. <laughs> yeah, that's it for me. <laughs> I, uh, along those same lines, I would say, um, God, there's so many things. It is like, you just don't hear about designers who want to retire. Oh, I hate this job, or I hate, I hate this career. I can't wait to get out of it. I'm like so ready to retire. You know, but designers, we don't retire. you don't <laughs> ever retire. It's always what next iteration of your design career is it going to be? How are you? You never stop creating, so you just keep going. You might not be working, say, corporate or something, but there's always, you're always creating something more. Um, a friend of mine early on, she said to me, you're, you're here to create beauty. And I just had never even thought about that, but that's what I do. It, it, the type of designing that I do. I just create beauty and just share that. And then, um, yeah, I mean, just enjoying the work, the team, and this is, the apparel industry and the fashion industry in general is crazy. I mean, just bottom line, it's nuts. Um, but everybody still really <laughs> loves who they work with and what they're doing. And, um, and it's the ultimate in teamwork because it just, you can't ever one person get it all done. So you're working just with multiple teams. A lot of times teams are all around the world. You're, you're working with people and you never meet them sometimes. You know, so, and the appreciation that you have, well, at least I know that I have for what everybody is bringing to the table, the amount of um, passion and dedication every Buddy along the supply chain has for something that I've designed is like that's pretty humbling, you know. I mean, it's not their design, maybe it's my design, but there's they love their job so much too, they're really invested to contribute to the quality of that. So, um, yeah, it's just uh, you just as a designer, you just don't ever stop designing, so yeah, it's super fulfilling. It's very much a lifestyle mm -hmm. because yeah. you are, you are surrounded by objects and environments every day that different mm -hmm. designers have touched and interacted with and gone on this journey to create and bring to fruition. And um, it's, it's, it's really magical to be one of those people. I mean, I, um, I primarily design bags so if I'm on Muni or on BART or traveling and I see uh, a pack that I've worked on, it's pretty awesome to just, you know, see someone expressing their style with something that I've created. It's, it's, it is, like you're saying, very humbling. And thank you.
This was one of the most, uh, for me, I don't know if y'all feel the same way, but this was a wonderful, wonderful, profound um, experience. I'm so glad that we decided to move forward with it, considering the state of the world right now. And I think fortune favors the bold, right? Um, let's give it up for our panelists, y'all. I'm terribly sorry to keep us eight minutes over. It's not my style, but I just wanted the magic to keep going. Um, Let's also now give a round of applause for Woody and Sala, Val One and Val Two production team. And then of course, I cannot forget about the wonderful volunteers from Team Fashion Kai, Zoe Torres and Marie Cruz, let's give it up for them. And of course, a big round of applause for you, the studio audience, thanks for coming to the amazing. My name is Arya Zarenkoke and this has been Workforce Wednesdays, Careers and Fashion. We'll see you next time.